Um, and it's actually very related because, of course, we're talking about this turmoil that we've gone through in some ways, um, whether it was present or not in different ways before. I totally take your point, Jesper. Um, but that's exactly what I'm higher also covers. So thanks to all of you. Um, we'll be back for more really soon. Um, but now's a chance to hear from Anne. Um, Anne, Anne, Anne Hayat is a Silicon Valley veteran with 15 plus years experience at two of the biggest and most well-known, you could argue, companies in the world, Google and Amazon. And it's also given her access to the leaders uh, of those companies. You may have heard of them uh, and their styles of leadership at the time as well. Um, she's had to ride the dot-com uh, bust in the early noughties or 2000s, uh, the financial crisis around the 2008, and setting up her own business as well during this pandemic, um, which of course hasn't gone away. It's fair to say that Anne has a thing or two to share about the best practices of surviving and thriving during a crisis. She has a podcast of her own as well, Bet On Yourself, and, uh, and a book later on, uh, on its way later on this year. So we caught up with Anne a few days ago, uh, starting with a look at her career and how it all began. Check this out. I'd just like to throw this at you. You say, you say of your time at the beginning of your career, I was very young, uh, it was very intimidating, but I knew that was never going to happen again. The internet was never going to be invented again. E-commerce was never going to be invented again. And I wanted a seat in that room. Working for leaders, I wanted to become like. And hired. welcome. It's safe to say you did become a leader in your own right. And now you're passing it on, helping others realize their potential as well. Um, what, what goes through your mind when you hear someone read back to you uh, all your achievements? Uh, I don't feel as fancy as that all sounded. I really don't. It was <laughs> Thank you for that overly generous uh, introduction and welcome. It has been quite a ride. I feel supremely privileged to have been in those rooms and witnessed those moments that will never happen again. And I'm thrilled that I can share a bit of what I've learned on the other side of it all uh, with everybody today. So. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Anne. And uh, I mean, there's plenty we could talk about regarding leadership, it's fair to say. But actually, um, in line with the event today, I'd like to focus in particular on how we can improve leadership and what you can share in, in that sense there. Um, how to, how to future-proof or sustain leadership, if you like. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you came to focus on this idea of improving leadership. My entire career, I've been surrounded by some of the best leaders in the world and witnesses their, both their best practices and also, equally important, a lot of their mistakes. And so I think the lessons learned through that experience really drives me in my new career post Google in consulting with CEOs around the world and also in, in speeches, putting together the podcast, the book are all similarly motivated. I feel like I have this unprecedented elite education sitting at their sides for those 18 hour days for the last two decades. And I, I feel really firmly about democratizing the internet. We need more voices, more diverse perspectives, more companies outside of Silicon Valley. We need um, more representation. I think if we learned anything in 2020, it was that we needed more leaders in the world, not fewer. We need people to actually take some ownership over these really important voices and causes and issues that have been brought up for us. And if I can be even a small part in inspiring that and helping someone recognize themselves as a leader or an entrepreneur when they might not have otherwise identified that way, that's also really meaningful to me. So I want to do anything I can to support global entrepreneurship. And that was a big motivation, honestly, for stepping outside of Silicon Valley and taking a chance, uh, moving myself to the other side of the world and starting this next phase of my career here in Europe. Thanks, Anne. I'm not going to throw too many of your own quotes at you, I promise. But there's one more thing you said that really caught my eyes. I love applying the lessons of innovation, ambition, growth at scale, and forward-thinking leadership that I learned at Amazon and Google to expanding businesses and individual careers. Now, anyone who either knows you, knows your business, caught uh, one of your talks, like the South by Southwest one, um, they might be familiar with this idea that you've modeled and invented yourself um, around personal ROI. Um, recognize it, own it, implement it. I'm not going to steal your thunder. I would love you to be able to expand on that and pack it for anybody who hasn't come across it. 
Sure. I'm really excited to share this because it's a big principle in my upcoming book. And I put together this ROI. The traditional definition, of course, is return on investment, which absolutely applies. But my spin on it is for the R is to really recognize. And that's about how you're defining success for yourself. I think being future proof is making sure that that definition comes from yourself and not external pressures or expectations of your family or your culture, your industry, your gender, whatever it might be. So really defining for yourself what success means to you and taking some ownership over that. So that's asking yourself to hone in on really what you want to do, what you want to contribute into this world. And I think equally important, who you want to do it with. It's the quality of people around you really set yourself you up for delivering something really unique for yourself. I think it's also an important part of what I call engineering serendipity, which we might get into a little bit more. Um, for me, engineering serendipity is about knowing what you want so that you recognize opportunities in their infancy, maybe a little grain of an idea or an opening in a door. You know where you're going, so you recognize it when it crosses your path and it otherwise might have just passed you by and you might have missed it. So that about recognizing is knowing what you're looking for and what you're seeking out. The O is about owning it. This is about reinvesting and reinventing yourself over and over again across your career. I absolutely have done that. I find I go in about three year cycles on this, which is an interesting pattern to recognize in retrospect. So this is about crafting some really big dreams, believing in yourself, in your uniqueness, leaning into that where you have a diversity of experience or thought and reinvesting in your skills consistently, up-leveling, learning new things, remaining curious and not considering your comfort zone, actually your comfort zone, recognizing that that's actually pretty dangerous and you wanna live on the edge of, of that comfort zone and consistently pu push yourself out of that. I think a third element of owning it is consistently investing in your network. Again, this goes back to the people you're surrounding yourself with and making sure they're people who keep you curious, help you question your own status quo, give diversity of thought and opinions, and um, really taking some advantages of pivot moments, which we're all in right now, using that to our advantage instead of disadvantage and working towards our end goals and um, seeking constant improvement. And that leads us to the last step, which is implement, which is really that endless cycle of putting in the hard work, pivoting, taking in those successes or those failures. I don't even use the word failure, really, because it's all just learning, the learnings that we have as we go along and pivoting with that. And that's how we create an action plan. How are we going to take this concept of what we want to do and what we want to be and how do we create something that's purposeful and proactive rather than being reactionary in our lives? Um, and that's really how you turn your dreams into a reality of what you're doing today. So that's ROI. Thank you very much. I'd like to step back then and kind of um, look into them a little bit further, if that's okay. Let's start with recognize. Of course, it makes sense to start at the start. Um, what is it about good leaders? What do they recognize in themselves during these pivot moments? I think good leaders need to remain two things very humble and very curious. Probably the most frequently asked question I receive is um, tell me the common denominators between these great leaders you've worked with. What makes Jeff and Eric similar? What, what is this best practice I can adopt? And if I, I think people are consistently surprised that my answer is humility and curiosity. You don't think of these larger than life celebrity CEOs as being defined by their humility but that is 100% in my opinion, the reason why they stay innovative and um, effective on their teams. So I think it's important to consistently look inside ourselves, see if there's opportunities where we could learn something new, we can stretch ourselves outside of our comfort zone, where we actively seek out feedback from our peers in our environment. You can do that in a formal way. For example, at Google, anyone who gets promoted to a VP or above goes through a formal 360 review where they do um, an assessment on themselves, but also those who work and report to them do that as well so they can see if there's a disconnect between the way they think they're being perceived or if they're being effective and the way it's actually translating onto their teams. So that's a formal way of doing it, but you can informally create some systems um, empowering the people around you to give you that feedback very consistently on a daily basis, creating that psychological safety where they feel like they have that permission, not only the permission, but really that you seek it out and you demand it from everyone around you. And I think that's something that Jeff Bezos and Eric Schmidt do exceptionally well. And uh, in that assessment, a self-assessment or that feedback you're getting from your team or your peers, 
really um, think about what strengths you need to develop. What are your greatest strengths and how can we maximize that in your work? Maybe also some things that are areas of weakness where you wanna make sure you've hired really well and that you're delegating to people who have that as a strength. And um, I think in crafting that environment, that's how you really um, are an effective leader in these pivot moments. And because you've been proactive in preparing yourself and building up your strengths, rather than being caught on the back foot when, and being reactive to something unexpected happening in your industry. Thank you. That, that leads really nicely on to, you, you talk about owning it. And uh, like, it sounds like you have to own this, you know, really take the front foot on it. And that leads nicely on to, own it, uh, which is like the O in ROI. And um, there's something I, I caught in something you said earlier about um, yeah, reinvesting and reinventing ourselves over and over again. And um, with, a, with a focus on sustaining leadership and sustainable leadership, if you like, um, I, I can imagine that some people will think that risk taking is contrary to that, you know, and it will send you into an absolute tizzy. So, I mean, with risk not feeling so secure, how do you, how do you see that? And, um, and what's, what's the benefits of taking a risk in great leadership? I feel really strongly about this one. And I think people will recognize a moment as I describe it. Uh, what we've really been through in the last year with the 2020 pandemic has showed us that actually complacency is far more dangerous to us than calculated risk taking. If we were complacent, that's going back to that being on the back foot, being caught off balance, not being prepared to take proactive decisions. But if you are in a consistent habit of pushing yourself outside your comfort zone, up-leveling your skills, disrupting your own status quo, um, if that will really lend itself to being in an environment where you can be proactive. Um, if you're not challenging your status quo or up leveling, you're primed for either becoming irrelevant or disrupted. And I think that's what's happening right now. Most of my clients have come out of the pandemic on the other side better off than they were before because they were prepared to take some risks. They had already been doing that data gathering. They've been watching their dashboards. They've been reinvesting in where they were getting good returns. And so now they come out the other side having fast forwarded their growth because they took some risks that they probably would have been too shy to take before and were forced to, but were prepared to, to handle that pivot uh, because that was the culture of their companies and what they demanded of themselves. So I think staying curious and humble comes into play here is again. And it's also how we don't become the next blockbuster or Kodak, where you're at the forefront, you are the gold standard of your industry, and then you don't recognize an opportunity to pivot into new technologies or take, the, take advantage of the changing opinions of your consumers or their behaviors. If you're not ready, if you're not seeking out that and you're just in a reactive mode, that's when you're primed for disruption. Thank you. In terms of the this, this kind of second part or one of the many parts of owning it that you mentioned was about this idea of setting expectations and, and disrupting the status quo, as you've just mentioned. I mean, what, what does that look like from a leadership perspective? I like to, um, I did not invent this term. I should look up who does, I should because I <laughs> this all the time, but there's something called the HIPPO effect that we talk about a lot in Silicon Valley. HIPPO stands for the highest individually paid person's opinion. And once the HIPPO has spoken in a room, innovation tends to stop. So I think one thing that we can do in this to disrupt the status quo is actually just by being quiet for a little bit longer and um, encouraging and demanding other voices in the room to participate. So to avoid the hippo effect, you need to have given a clear vision, a top-down vision of where we're going. Uh, so we all have a common North Star, but then you encourage bottom-up innovation by um, creating some systems of feedback, having an open door policy, getting the junior members of your team to feel empowered to speak up and offer their opinions earlier. And then you get really innovative voices because these novice opinions, they're not burdened by the way that things have always been done. They don't even realize they're being disruptive. They're just coming at it from a different experience or perspective. And so avoiding the hippo effect is how you stay really innovative and on the front foot of that. The hippo effect is not something I've heard of before. This is wonderful. I, I too will go and look it up and just uh, find out a bit more, but it, it makes such sense. 
Um, so coming on to the uh, the implement stage, um, I, I, you talk about these these moments of serendipity, these beautiful moments of serendipity. You know, serendipity is a beautiful thing. Um, I'm really keen to know what yours are and maybe what those are of some of the leaders you, you've come across as well. Like, and, and, and what should aspiring leaders be looking for in terms of serendipity? I think engineering serendipity is my career in a single phrase. <laughs> I have been supremely lucky. I acknowledge my privilege. Not many people get to be exposed to these people even in brief moments. And I sat next to them for every waking hour for the last two decades. And that is great luck. But I say engineered serendipity because yes, I was lucky to get in that first room which created this ripple effect that created this career I never would have dared dream of. But I, I was lucky to get that first interview. But once I did, and I recognized the privilege of watching this irreplicable moment in time, I chose to work harder than anyone else in the room. I was not only going to outwork everyone, I was going to outcare everyone. And trying to outcare everyone helped me be not only reactive in the assignments I was given, but very proactive because I was so passion aligned with what my leaders were trying to accomplish, what we were putting into the world that no one had to ask me to work 18 hour days or come in on the weekends. I just didn't wanna miss it. I wanted to be there in those magical moments where something finally clicks and the war room produces the, the solution we need or the launch goes really well or it doesn't and I wanna be part of the solution for helping fix it. If you have that attitude of knowing what you wanna get out of the environment, you can be uh, really proactive and create some opportunities for yourself. And I think I really look for that in an environment where I think there's three things I really credit my career to. One was I worked for leaders I wanted to become like, as you, as you mentioned earlier, that was really, really important to me. Not only leaders that I liked and enjoyed, but ones that I wanted to become like. Um, two, I was in disruptive industries. It was a pace that I found really thrilling and um, something that kept me on my toes and led to my third most important value in my career, which is I wanted to always be in environments where I was gonna be learning as much as possible. I think those three things together are how I created and engineered some serendipity that even, I mean, even if I had been in those rooms and been in that junior most role in Jeff Bezos's office, it could have remained very reactive and I could have been easily forgotten. But I, by recognizing what I wanted to get out of it and being really proactive about it, I created some opportunities to sit in rooms that I otherwise never would have been invited into and owning some projects that I had no business of being in charge of. Um, and that forces you to learn really fast. It sounds like you just had the magic ingredients at the right time. And it, it's, it's fun that you mention um, being a junior or having a junior role, because I, I guess there's, um, I guess there's a there's a workforce now that is uh, much younger than myself, at least, uh, starting out. And they are starting in junior roles, starting on their careers. Others are looking to repurpose their careers. And you've you've spent a, a lot of your time focusing on uh, leadership strategies as, as such. Um, but but what about this millennial workforce where their expectation, their needs and wants, their demands even, are uh, slightly different than, than perhaps when we entered uh, the job market? Um, what, uh, what, what should leaders consider in that respect for the millennials in the workforce? I think that's such an important question for the future of our companies and careers is knowing how to pair well with this generation that's just coming into the workforce in a really strange moment in time. Uh, I think millennials actually offer us a wonderful opportunity to recenter our work, our companies, and our contribution to the world on what we're most passionate about. Uh, all of my CEO clients, regardless of whether they're at a hundred million dollar valuation or if they're raising their series A, they all of their questions really come back to the conversations around what is your mission, what is your vision, and what are your values? And I think millennials are craving that, not only craving it, they're demanding that of the employers that they come. It really informs their spending as a consumer, and it absolutely informs their career choices. And I think that's a great opportunity for all of us to do the same. Uh, a lot of the complexities that come when you're scaling, when you're expanding, when you're pivoting, like we all are right now, those 
all those conversations come back to what is your mission, vision, and values at the company because the answers lie in that. If you haven't properly defined that for yourself, you're going to become really disoriented as you pivot. But if you have that well-defined North Star and something that is beyond just a slogan on the wall in our lobby, you know, when we return to offices, <laughs> beyond that, is it part of your conversations? Are your leaders, are your junior employees quoting that mission statement as they're trying to make really hard decisions? Uh, is that something that's part of your vernacular? Is that the vocabulary your company uses? If not, it's not having the impact or the intended purpose of having a well-crafted mission statement. And I think millennials help us recenter on that. I think they also come with a big challenge because a lot of them in the Instagram world, you only are presented by the end of someone else's story. You very rarely are exposed to the messy middle. And that's a big challenge because they get frustrated very early because they expect to be able to perform at that level. Let me tell you, if you sat next to me for the three years I was at Amazon, it was all messy middle. There was no polish, there was no shine. It was just making it up as we went, myself and everyone around me included. And I think that was a real gift. Um, because if I had gone into a company where everything was perfect and polished, I would have been so intimidated. I wouldn't have volunteered to do things that I did. Looking back, I see how brave I was back then. I just was too naive to know that I had no business doing any of that. But I, I came into an environment where we were all doing things that none of us knew how to do because no one in the world had ever done it before. And that gave me permission to step outside of my box to not only take on projects that I felt I could perform perfectly, but to challenge myself because I saw that behavior around me at every level in the company. And I think that's the greatest like luck and um, joy that the universe could have given me at that stage in my life because it allowed me to overcome my natural perfectionist tendencies and to take some risks, make some really big mistakes. Um, but I had permission to do so because that's the environment I was in. So hopefully we can lean in to the strengths of what the millennials are bringing and help them overcome some of those things that might hold them back that they probably don't even realize are affecting them. Thank you. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. I love that you call this a gift. The positive kind of perspective on that, on that messy middle, great terminology, by the way, I hope that's in your book. Uh, the, the, the messy middle or this complexity, as you called it earlier um, as well, I think, I think that's so relevant to the times that we're in. You know, we all have um, different lives, different backgrounds at the moment, um, and we're all dealing with the pandemic in a very different way. And while you're talking, I just made a little note to myself as well that I, as someone who works for a design company, and you know, this is, we're, we're always looking at things that are design challenges. And this feels very much like a design challenge, you know, let's call on design. Now there's, there's something in there. And I'm, I'm really interested then in how uh, yourself and other great leaders, how you deal with that complexity in those pivot moments. What, what goes through your mind, if anything? It's a great question. It's, this is really, really important to get right. And I think that people, leaders have been tempted to overcomplicate this. And again, I think it comes back to the basics of, of why you're there doing, what's your mission? What are we doing together? Where are we trying to go? Because otherwise it can be very disorienting. So the basics for me, really the best practices I've seen across all my clients in the last year and a half has been one, over communicate. You think you've said something, but actually um, research shows that people need to hear something seven times before they really actually internalize it. So you might be like, I feel like a broken record, but no, really over communicate, especially in moments of pivot or change, making sure that people hear it, they feel supported, they've got psychological safety, not only communicating what we're going to do and what we're pivoting to, but show them the math. Show them what we're solving for and why this is the solution. Because if they understand how you created this equation for where we're going, they feel more sense of ownership and understanding of how they're gonna interpret that through their work now. I think some leaders make the mistake of not communicating it enough and not communicating the why of the what they're asking them to do. So that's first. Second is I mentioned earlier, making sure you have an open door policy. This is essential while we're still remote from each other. And as we're transitioning into kind of a hybrid model of coming back, but not being totally together as we were in the past, having an open door policy is really important so that leadership feels more accessible and not less. A lot of my clients have had really good results um, doing something I call office hours. 
inspired by the university environment where you have this lecture and you're up there and you're presenting to your company and you think, great, we all have the same plan. And then they go to do their homework, they go to do their job and they're not quite sure how to interpret it. You want them to come to office hours so that not only your um, leadership team, you know, your direct reports is coming to you, but any level of the company can come and get, ask a quick clarifying question. So maybe the junior most intern on your team has an opportunity through office hours to sign up for just literally a 30 second question. These moments we used to do around the water cooler. If you have a time on your calendar where they can just pop in for a quick question that they never would have been brave enough to go to your assistant and be like, because they don't need 30 minutes, they need a quick gut check. They, my CEOs who have adopted this have had amazing ideas come to them that they never would have been exposed to otherwise. And it really helped this junior level of their company feel aligned and valued by their leadership. So I, I recommend giving that a try. And then I think really doubling down on focusing on the culture. You might have onboarded some people you've never met in person. Maybe it was a Zoom hire. You maybe had to pivot the way you celebrate your big wins or the way that you um, internalize your culture. I think doubling down on that is essential right now so that people feel a sense of pride and identity around being part of what you're building. And um, maybe that's a very American perspective because we are naturally defined by our work. But I think <laughs> celebrating the culture of what you're doing and why you're doing it helps everyone come together. And that's how you get that grit factor. That's another commonly asked question by my clients is how do I keep people really gritty while we're kind of in this pandemic fatigue? And I think that alignment of, of culture and why we're here and why we're doing it is, is how you get that next level of grit while we're all waiting for the light at the end of this tunnel. What do you mean by grit? What, what exactly do you mean by that? Grit is a term coined by a behavioral psychologist, Angela Duckworth. She has a book by that same title, Grit. Highly recommend it. One of the most influential books I've ever read. And grit is that factor where you get an extra... What's the best way? I, I, she phrases it so beautifully. I feel like any one sentence summary isn't going to do it justice. But it's that factor of the, the people who go the extra mile. They're so committed and so value aligned that they anticipate needs. They do things before they're asked. They're very, very proactive. So these are ambitious, highly intelligent people who, given the right understanding of our North Star, are going to proactively take some steps to get there. So imagine sandpaper, for example. The higher the grit, the, the more impact it's going to have on the work. Um, and so this is how you get those highly motivated people to be really effective in your company. That was a terrible summary of a beautiful book. Please go read Grit by Angela Duckworth. <laughs> it's one of the most important um, things in business and, and also a really good playbook for how to get the most out of the millennial generation, for sure. But thank you. And I, I love the analogy of the sandpaper. It makes total sense to me when you explain it like that. So I think you explained it really well. And, and talking about books, I mean, you have, well, you have your podcast, which I recommend everybody go and listen to. I really love it. Um, and then you've got your book coming out soon. I mean, it, it wouldn't be right of me not to ask you about your book a little bit. Just so what, it's coming out later this year. And what can we expect to find in it? Thank you. I am really excited about it. It's been a labor of love. It was delayed because of the pandemic. It was supposed to already be out, but we've pushed it to October. So it'll be available for pre-sale mid-June. And um, the publication date in the States is October 12th. It will be coming to Europe shortly after that. Uh, it's titled Bet on Yourself, as you mentioned, uh, same name as my podcast. And it's really about how do you create opportunities for yourself, especially when off especially when options appear limited on the surface. So it's whether you're in that junior most position at the beginning of your career, or maybe you're mid-career and really wanting to be acknowledged as a leader, take on a new client, be recognized for promotion, get into that senior leadership category, or as a CEO yourself, how do you get this out of your employees and how do you demand that of yourself and continue to up level and focus yourself not only on today, but looking at that long-term legacy that you're trying to build. So these are some of the best practices that I've seen from these celebrity CEOs I've worked for. I then use my own career story as a lens to show you that it doesn't just apply to them. It can be applied by us normal humans in our normal looking careers. But I think Jeff Bezos and Eric Schmidt might feel a little inaccessible to most of us. But I've interpreted that of how did I use channel their best practices into my own life and what did that look like? What I share a lot of mistakes I made along the way, but it's full of some best practices and I wrote it to be very actionable. You can read it as a story 
where you can kind of experience the crazy journey that was my career in the early internet days. But then also it's very applicable. They have the ROI challenges at the end of each chapter where you can then go back and reflect and implement some of those um, best practices and recommendations into your career and um, accomplishing your goals today. So I'm really excited about it. And season three of Bet On Yourself podcast is going to be all around the book. I've got some spectacular guest lines up, lined up for it. You're not going to want to miss it. I am I am even like wowed by the people who have said yes to be interviewed on this. So stay tuned. There's some great surprises coming. What a great teaser. I'm going to go and order my book as soon as I can. I'm going to, when's the podcast coming out? When, when's the season three? Is that? Season two at the moment. I think it's um, in five weeks. I think season three will start. So it's a nice teaser for the book while we're in pre-sale. I'm going to set my alarm for that one. And thanks very much. Hey, time's up. But thank you very, very much for, for sharing everything. You're so open uh, about the whole process, all your thoughts. I absolutely love it. I learned a lot. I think other people will have as, will have as well. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Phil. I had so much fun. Next time in person, I hope. I hope so too.